All right. Well, I want to thank Craig and Jody, and there's so many that helped put this together, and uh, I don't want to go through a list of names, but uh, you know who you are, and thank you so much. We are blessed to be here, and uh, it's going to be a great evening. Um, we just really want the Lord to be honored, and I know Rabbi Jack is going to be a true blessing to all of us, and we want to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Uh, this is really all about Jesus. And Yeshua, he's the one that has fulfilled uh, Passover. And so uh, let's open up in a word of prayer. And I'll pray also for the meal, which isn't for a while, but I'll pray for that. And then uh, Jody's going to, you know, like she said, table by table will be uh, dismissed to go get the food. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this glorious day you've given us. I thank you for all these men and women, boys and girls that were able, that were able to come here tonight we pray that you would be blessed and glorified in all that we say, all that we do. And Lord, we just pray that you would um, speak to all of our hearts and, and show us just how glorious you are. And we thank you, Lord, for um, passing over all of our sins through the sacrifice of Jesus. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. And we do pray that you would bless the food to our bodies, use it to nourish and strengthen us, that we might be vessels of honor for your glory all the days of our life. And Lord, we just commit this time to you now and pray that uh, you would just uh, energize, if he needs any more energy, energize Rabbi Jack Zimmerman. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Welcome, Rabbi Jack. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Jeff. Bill, is my mic on? It, now, I'm never sure. I'm in New York, and my voice just carries even without this thing. Let's give God all the praise tonight. He is worthy. Let's praise him. I have to tell you, I, I am so beyond excited because this I'm thinking, and I've been doing seders for, for like 20, 25 years. This may very well be the first seder that I've never seen a seder so packed before. This may be the first seder where we don't even have a place for Elijah. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, yeah, but Jeff, people are coming in late. I have a feeling these seats will be filled. Never happened before. Can you imagine? It's like Elijah comes up. I'm sorry, we're all bucked up. You'll have to come next year. Uh, by the way, for how many of you is this your first ever Passover Seder? Would you raise your hand? Really? Wow. Me too. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, why don't I give a little bit of an introduction so that, uh, so that we can get to know one another a little bit better. And one of the reasons that I want to do that is because I had the opportunity to meet so many of you while you were coming in. We shook hands. And some of you actually were bold enough, and I appreciate this, to ask, so what kind of rabbi are you? And, and I know what that question means, because based upon my answer, you'd say, okay, um, is he already a believer in Jesus, or do we need to spend the entire night trying to get him saved? So I, I think what I'll do is I'll give you a little, bit of, a little bit of a testimony so that we can get to know one another a little bit better. Uh, I was born in a Jewish home in the Holy Land. Praise the Lord. Brooklyn, New York. And um, <laughs> that's terrible. I shouldn't have done that to you. And uh, growing up, uh, my parents had three requests of me to honor them as a Jewish son. There were three things, only three things they asked me to do. And the first thing they asked me to do is they said, son, we want you to learn the Hebrew, the language of your faith. And that was the first thing they wanted me to do, and I did that. And the second thing they wanted me to do is they said, son, when you turn the age of 13, we want you to have your bar mitzvah, a Jewish boy's entry into manhood. And that was the second thing they wanted me to do, and I did that. And the third thing they wanted me to do is they said, son, when the time comes for you to get married, we want you to marry a girl who is Jewish. And that was the third thing they wanted me to do. And two out of three ain't bad. I um, uh, met and married this wonderful blonde-haired, so not Jewish, um, blue-eyed Protestant girl from Northeast Philadelphia who grew up going to a private Christian academy and was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. And my family was so not amused by this. And they basically said, they said, look, son, you need to watch out. 
because she believes in Jesus and we're Jews and we don't. And, and so you make sure you get her to, to convert and forget Jesus and become Jewish like you. And you'll see how well that one worked out. And I want to share with you how she did it. Not only because it's a great story, but because it's important enough to be spoken about in Scripture. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 11, 11, that he's given all of you in here a chosen calling. How many of you have heard that the Jewish people are called the chosen people? Right, see, everybody tells you that, but here's what nobody tells you. You all are just as equally chosen. And part of the beautiful calling that God gave you was to make people like me, Jewish people like me, envious, jealous, make us hungry for the Messiah Jesus that you embraced and the one that we rejected. And thank God I embraced him. And uh, it happened, actually, God used my wife to lead me into a relationship with Jesus. It was very early on in our marriage. And one day, my wife, Sandy, opened up the Bible to me and she said, I want to share with you some verses that speak about your promised Jewish Messiah. And I knew where she was going, so I said, I tell you what, you can share anything in that Bible you want. You feel free to start at the book of Genesis. Just don't go past the book of Malachi. <laughs> because I knew, I knew that if she stayed in my Old Testament, I wouldn't have anything to worry about. Because, of course, there's nothing about Jesus in the Old Testament. Ha! Ha! And she said, fine. She said, let me read something to you. I said, fine, stay in my book. I don't want to hear about Jesus. She opened up her Bible. I couldn't see where, and she started reading this. Listen, for he grew up before him like a tender plant, like a root, like a shoot out of the dry ground. And he had no beauty to attract us to him. Yet he was despised and rejected by men, for he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. Listen to this part. The chastisement of our peace is on his shoulders. In other words, the punishment that we deserve, the sin that we committed that we should pay for, here's the irony of it all. He took it from us. What an incredible God we serve. And by his stripes, by his wounds, by his blood, we are healed. And my wife put the Bible down and looked at me and said, so? <laughs> And I said, so I don't think you listened to me. I told you I wanted you to stay in my Old Testament. I don't want to hear about this Jesus. And she turned the Bible around and she said, Jack, I just read to you the first five verses of the 53rd chapter of the book of oh, Isaiah. She said, Jack, Isaiah, isn't he on your team? And I said, yeah, and she was right. And the year was 1988. The month was April. I gave my life and my heart to the Lord Jesus, Yeshua, in uh, probably the Jewish Mecca of the United States, Fort Pierce, Florida. And here we are in Grand Junction, Colorado tonight, and God is so good. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. I currently serve uh, two capacities. I pastor or I'm the rabbi for a messianic congregation in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where Jews and Christians get together to worship Christ, worship Christ in a Jewish culture and context. And anybody in here ever hear of a ministry called Jewish Voice Ministries International with Rabbi Jonathan Burnus? Humor me. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. A couple of you did. I'm the staff evangelist for Jewish Voice, and what a blessing to be with you tonight. Um, I want to let you know that oftentimes Passover is seen solely as a Jewish thing because uh, the reason for that is because it, it, it has an early appearance in a book that Jewish people like to read, and it's, it's one of the most thrilling and exciting and dramatic books of the Bible, <laughs> Leviticus. And so what we're going to do is tonight, I'm going to give you the Old Testament short summary of the Passover, but tonight what we're going to be doing is we're going to connect the dots to the New Testament, because if you only stay at a Passover Seder in the Old Testament, you're missing the whole story about Jesus. You can't have a Seder if Jesus is not in it. So we're going to be all over Christ tonight because the Passover was, is, and always will be about him. And there's one word that connects the Old Testament story to the New Testament fulfillment, and that word is the word redemption. So let me just take you both of them, through both of them very quickly, and then we'll get started on our Seder tonight. Here's where we begin. 
The only reason that we have Passover in the first place is because about 3,500 years ago, a whole lot of people got hungry and there was no food. It's true. There was a famine in the land of Israel. Abraham and Sarah went through it. Isaac and Rebekah then went through another one. And Jacob and his family then went through a third famine. Each time they all went through a famine, they left Israel and came back. Although Jacob and his family left Israel and didn't come back for another 200 years or so. Jacob and his family, however, found plenty of food to eat in Egypt. Do you know why? It's because about 20 years earlier, 11 of Jacob's sons had sold their brother Joseph into slavery. Joseph was falsely accused, thrown in prison, ended up interpreting a dream for the Pharaoh of Egypt. And the Pharaoh said, I'm going to make you second in charge, second in command. Joseph at that point said, Pharaoh, there is a famine coming and I need to store food in the storehouses for the Egyptians. And that's what he did. But little did Joseph or anyone else realize that the food he was storing to feed Egypt would go to feed his very own brothers and mother and father. Don't you love how God loves to work out a plan so many years in advance? Amen? So the Israelites moved to Egypt, where they lived for many, many years in relative peace. Until one day, a new pharaoh, a new king came on the throne. And unlike his predecessor, he was not at all happy having all of these Israelites around. He was worried that they would gain too much political power and control. So the king issued two decrees. The first decree was that the Pharaoh took all of the adult Israelites and put them in chains and bondage and made them slaves. The second decree was that the Pharaoh called for the death of every male newborn Israelite child. Now, at that time, there had been a woman. She gave birth to a male Israelite child. She wanted to save him from the decree. So she placed the child in a basket, sent the basket down the river. You all know, I hope, the child's name was... Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much I appreciate that because that's not the answer I always get. A couple of weeks ago, I was in, where was I doing a Seder? In Ville Platte, Louisiana. That's, they, they wanted to serve crawfish at the Seder. I said, no, it's a Jewish thing. Don't do that. But I asked the question. I said, you know, a woman, a, a child born and sent the child in the basket, in the basket down the river. I said, what was the child's name? And most everybody got it right, but there was this big burly guy in the back who said, that was Charlton Heston. I'm like, no. <laughs> so Moses, not Charlton Heston, grew up in the palace and one day met God at a burning bush. And God said, Moses, those Hebrew slaves, those people, they're your people. And you need to th tell the Pharaoh of Egypt, to let the Israelite slaves go. And Moses did that. Moses went to Pharaoh and over and over again told Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. And Pharaoh over and over again responded to Moses by saying no. Each time the Pharaoh said no, God brought a plague down on the land. Terrible things began to happen. Water turning to blood, light turning to dark, hail coming from the skies in the mid-afternoon, cattle disease, lice, marshmallows, what is that? Oh, wait, you guys brought marshmallows. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, this is hail. Okay, so this, uh, I don't know where to go with that one. Okay, so anyway, after nine plagues, I'm so glad you did that. I don't know why. After nine plagues, Pharaoh allowed, Pharaoh would still not allow the Israelites to go free. And at that point, God said, Moses, I'm going to bring a tenth and final plague down on the land. And when I do, Pharaoh will release the Israelite slaves. I need you to listen close to this one, because here's where the story goes to a whole nother level. God said, Moses, I'm going to send for this tenth and final plague my angel of death into the city to strike down every male newborn Egyptian child. But I want to make sure that no Israelites are harmed in the decree. No Israelite children. I want to make sure, Moses, that when I send my angel of death into the town, that he'll be able to tell the difference between an Egyptian home and an Israelite home, so that when he sees an Israelite home, he will not bring any pain or death to it. Instead, what he will do is he will pass over it. So God told Moses, here's what I want you to do. 
in order that the Israelite homes could be distinguished from the Egyptian. God said, Moses, tell the head of every Israelite household to go out and slay a lamb. And scripture says, take the blood from that lamb and smear that blood on the lintel and the doorposts of their houses. Now, you're probably familiar with what doorposts are. You might not be familiar with what a lintel of the doorpost is. So here's what I'm going to do. Because as I was coming into the room, I realized that if I were to go over to one doorway, there's not enough folks who would be able to see that doorway. So I'm going to go over to two. I'm going to go over to this doorway first so that these people on this side of the room can see the analogy and the illustration that I'm making. And then I'll see you guys in a second and I'll show you the same thing. So when God said, Moses, tell the head of every Israelite household to go and slay a lamb and smear the blood from that lamb on the lintels and the doorposts, here's what you need to know. You obviously at any doorway have a vertical post on each side. You see the horizontal beam that goes on the cross on the top? That's called the lintel of the doorway. You got that picture? All right. Guys, let me tell you now on the other side of the room. At any time that you go to a doorway, you always have two vertical posts, one on one side, one on the other side. You see the horizontal beam that goes across on the top? That's called the lintel of the doorway. So now that all of you know that, let's, uh, l- let's look at that. So when God told Moses to tell the head of every Israelite household to go out and slay a lamb, you're good, and take the blood from that lamb and smear it on the lintel and the doorposts, Somewhere along the lines, they would have made the following shape, or two of them. Watch. We smear the blood on a lintel. We smear the blood on a doorpost. Anybody see anything interesting in there? Right. So we have the imagery, if you will, of the blood of an innocent, spotless lamb that was slain, and that blood smeared in the prefigurement of a cross. But that's not all, because when you take the blood and you smear it, on the doorpost, the lintel, and the doorpost, you make the shape of a Hebrew letter. And that Hebrew letter is pronounced chet. Jody, you were right. There's going to be a lot of ch tonight going on. It's the Hebrew letter chet. It's the first letter in the Hebrew word chatat, which is the word for sin. So we not only have the illustration of an innocent, spotless, blameless lamb whose blood was shed in the prefigurement of a cross, but when the Israelites acknowledged that blood, guess what that blood did for them? That blood covered their sins. Their chains of slavery and bondage came off. Pharaoh allowed the Israelites to leave. They were redeemed. They went under to their promised land. How many of you know that's their story? You know why we're here tonight? Because it's not just their story. It's even more so our story. We as believers in Jesus have a lot in common with those Israelites because before we knew Christ, guess what? We too were slaves just as much. Maybe not to an earthly Pharaoh, but to a devil. But what happened? Jesus, our lamb, came and shed his blood on what is the fulfillment of a lintel and a doorpost. And when he did that for us, and we, through Romans 10, 9, acknowledged that blood and confessed him as Lord, guess what that blood did for us? That blood covers our sins. Our chains of slavery and bondage came off. We are redeemed, and now we have the promise of the promised land of eternal life in heaven. It's good for an amen. Go ahead and say it. Amen. That's why we're here. Um, and, And Pastor Jeff, this is such a great night that we can do this because... Everybody likes to to do a Passover Seder, which means order. And we always want to do it as close as possible to the actual Passover holiday. Guys, I got to tell you, you really can't get any closer than this. You know when Passover is this year? How about sundown tomorrow night? Sundown tomorrow night begins Passover this year. We are so in the right time to be prepared for this. And it's customary on the first two nights of Passover to have what's called a Passover Seder which means order referring to an order of service. And everything we have on our tables tonight is designed to bring us through a holy service. So what I want to do right now is on the one hand, I want to give you a description of the items and elements that you have on your tables because we're going to go through them. On the other hand, let me answer another question that was asked by someone when they sat down at their table and they looked at me and they said, Oh, please tell me this is not all we're eating tonight. 
please tell, please. We have a caterer here, so I don't want you to worry. Listen, this is, this is where are we again? What's the town? I know that. This is, listen, this is Grand Junction. We love you. We're going to feed you normal food, okay? All right. So let me give you a description of what you have on your tables, and then we'll go through the ritual of all of it. You'll see that each and every one of you has a cup of grape juice. It's not meant to be partaken of as a casual beverage. We're going to partake of this cup four different times tonight, and each cup goes by a different name. I'll be giving you the name of each and every cup, explaining its Old Testament significance and its New Testament fulfillment in Christ. You will also see, let me see what we've got over here. We have uh, uh, really two receptacles of water. We have a pitcher that has clear water in it. And then we have a, a, a smaller cup that also has water in it. But this water isn't exactly as clear. In fact, it's kind of cloudy, and that's because it's from Fruita. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. That's terrible. That's great, the Fruita people will never talk to me again. Also, you have two candles on your table. Uh, we'll be lighting the candles. Do we have fire extinguishers? Uh, like the alarms won't, we're okay? You don't mind what we can test them tonight? Excellent, praise the Lord, Jeff. Uh, let's see, also on your tables, you will see, and I think, Jody, you alluded to this before, you have uh, napkins, and in those napkins, you have several slices, and I'll show it to you, of what's called matzah or unleavened bread. And let me just tell you, in case you've never tried this before, you need to know, this stuff tastes great with something. Just put something on it. Don't eat it the way it is. And uh, in the middle of your tables, you have a round plate, not surprisingly referred to as a Seder plate. And uh, there are five items or elements on it. Earlier, jo uh, Jody showed you the charosis, the smaller cup that's nut-free. The larger cup on your table has the, the nuts, as well as the apples and, and honey and cinnamon, probably dates. You also have on your table several sprigs of parsley. There's also a hard-boiled or roasted egg. And then there's a small cup in here. It, it's kind of like this uh, off-white creamy mixture. Some of you were looking at it. You may think it's butter, <laughs> but it's not. It's uh, horseradish. It may be very hot horseradish. I don't know. We had a Seder the other night in Fort Collins. People had no idea what kind of horseradish it was. They found out the hard way. Half the folks ran out of the room. We're still looking for them, so I just want to. And also, finally, on each one of your tables, you have an actual lamb shank bone and because uh, we like to keep it authentic. And I think we are just about ready to start. You ready to do this? Okay. I'm going to take you through the actual order of the Passover Seder. We're going to see Christ in all of it where he always was and where he always will be. We're here to glorify our Savior tonight. So let's find him in places in Scripture where he's been waiting for us for discover him, to, to discover him. What I want you to do, everyone, <clears throat> is we'll begin our Seder by partaking of the first of our four cups of grape juice. Each cup goes by a different name. <clears throat> this first cup is called the cup of sanctification or holiness. And here's the significance of it. Why did God bring the Israelites out of slavery and bondage in Egypt? Was it because they were just such a wonderful, obedient, righteous bunch of folks? <clears throat> How many of you know not even close? God didn't bring them out of Egypt because they were holy. He brought them out of Egypt because he wanted them to be holy. Why? Because a rabbi tells you so? How about because the Bible says so? It's in Leviticus 19, too. Some of you are taking notes. That's the address you want. The Lord said to the Israelites, you be holy, for I am holy. And so this cup is a reminder of that. It's also a reminder of something else or actually someone else. You see the color of the grape juice in your cup? That's intentional. It is there to be to all of us as a reminder of Christ's blood, which begs the following question. What does the blood of Jesus have to do with our holiness? Uh, how about everything? There is nothing that we have ever done or will ever do 
to try to attain holiness and righteousness. In fact, the prophet Isaiah tells us, don't even waste our time because any righteousness we think we have, it's no better than filthy rags. Our holiness doesn't come from anything we have ever done. Our holiness can only come because of everything that Christ already did. So, if you're not already doing so, I'll ask that you raise your cup. What I will do is sing the traditional Hebrew blessing over the first cup only. I'll translate it for you in the English, and I'll show you how even this traditional Hebrew blessing always pointed to Christ and always will. Blessing sounds like this. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Borei piri agafen, Amen. And that means, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe who creates, listen, the fruit of the vine, and who reminds us in places like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, twice in fact there, where Jesus tells us that he is our first fruits. And then Jesus reminds us in John chapter 15, it's twice in there as well, that he's also the vine. We are the branches. And if we remain in him, we will bear much fruit. That's it. Now take a sip of your cup. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> now at your tables, you see a bowl that has a hand towel on it. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take the hand towel out of the bowl and have someone at your table take that two-handled pitcher, if, if you will, or the, you know, yep, and pour the water from that pitcher into the bowl. There we go. Thank you so much for doing that. Now, in the order of the Passover Seder, the next part of the order or the next ritual is is going to be a ritual hand washing. Let me explain. That's because in just a few minutes, we're going to be partaking of food items and food elements. And so prior to that, the custom is to have a washing of hands. Now, in a moment, what you'll do, but not yet, is you'll place your hands in the bowl of clear water to wash. And growing up in a Jewish home, uh, I remember, I think I, I was about five or six and my family would do this each year. And I remember one year, I asked my mom, I said, Mom, why do we put our hands in the bowl to wash? And she gave me the answer that every Jewish mother gives to their Jewish son. And the Jewish son asks a question. She said, son, I don't know. Go ask your father. And so I did. <laughs> and he said, the reason you put your hands in the bowl to wash is because it's an act of humility. You want to come humbly before God and express humility for this holy service that we're engaging in. And at a traditional Passover in a Jewish home, that's where the significance ends. For we who are believers in Christ, this is where the significance begins, and it's major. Let me explain why. Many of you don't know this. We've been using the term Passover Seder over and over several times. You might not be familiar with the term Passover Seder as much as you will be familiar with another term that speaks of the same thing. How about Jesus' Last Supper? My friends, Christ's Last Supper was his Passover Seder with his disciples. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that earlier in the afternoon, Christ told his disciples, go and find a place to prepare the Passover meal. And you know what's, what's really neat about this hand washing and why it's so significant for us? It's because it would have been right around this time in Christ's Passover Seder Last Supper that we're told something very, very profound and beautiful happened in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. It says that at that point, <clears throat> Jesus took a hand towel from around his waist and then he got hold of a wash basin. And in one of the most beautiful acts of humility, he proceeded to wash and dry the feet of his disciples. Think about this. This is the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is God manifest in the flesh, come down from heaven to wash ordinary people's dirty feet. That is incredible humility and amazing love. And it shows that Jesus was serious when he said that the two greatest commandments I love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He said, on those two commandments hang all of the rest. He did that for his 
disciples. You could just imagine how they felt inside when he was washing and drying their feet. I believe, I believe we can get pretty close to feeling what Jesus' disciples felt 2,000 years ago. And so in order to do that, we're going to be doing something a little bit different in this hand washing. And I'm already starting to see looks of concerns. Don't worry, keep your shoes on. We're not going there. But here's what we will do. In the spirit of Christ showing love for neighbors, and the Bible tells us it's a wonderful term. It's called imitatio Dei, be like God. Here's what we're going to do. When the bowl of clear water comes over to you at your tables in a minute, yes, I want you to put your hands in the bowl of clear water to wash. But after you do that, I do not want you to take the hand towel on the table to dry your hands. I want the person sitting to the right of you at your table. Everybody's looking to the right now. I want the person sitting to the right of you at your table to take the hand towel and to lovingly dry your hands for you. After they do that, move the bowl of clear water over to them. They will then place their hands in the bowl of clear water and the person to their right will then take the hand towel and lovingly dry your hands for you. Do that go around the entire table in the spirit of just the way that Jesus exemplified how we can love our neighbor. Let's show our neighbor love through this wonderful, beautiful hand washing of his last supper Passover Seder. Go ahead and do that right now. Heavenly Father, bless and continue to anoint this pastor, Lord God, as the shepherd of the flock, Lord, here. Help him strengthen not only they in spiritual maturity, but give him times of resting and refreshing so that he can be renewed as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There you go, sister. I'm going to come on over and move over to you, okay? All right. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Oh my goodness. Jody, your table looks like you guys are having so much fun. Y'all go around the table twice? What are you doing? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> wow. Praise God. Now, when, uh, when you finish up at your tables with the hand washing, making sure, of course, that, that you uh, dried someone else's hands with the towel and they did that for you, you, you can actually now at this point light the candles at your tables. But let me tell you how we're going to do that. There's a certain process that's done. And I'll tell you what the, what the blessing is for this. It's traditional that when the candles are lit, for Passover at the table, that the one at the table who needs to light them must be a woman. So I'll ask, please, at your table, please allow a woman to light the candles at the tables. What I'll do is I'll recite the blessing after the candles are lit. I'll tell you what it means, and then I'll explain why it's a woman lighting the candles and what the connection is to Jesus, because he's in all of this all through it. So go ahead and light those candles right now. Well, 
There you go. The Hebrew blessing, by the way, that's said as your candles are lit, sounds something like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kiddishanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu lechad lekner shel yom tov. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us the blessing of lighting the lights of the festival. Now, here's what this has to do with Jesus. Why do we have a woman light the candles at the table? Because the women who did now are reminders and symbols of Mary, the woman who gave us Jesus, the light of the world. Got it? All right. Now, everyone, what I'd like is, would you have, please, one person at your tables to kind of act as the table leader and distribute at the tables? Make sure that every one of you at your tables gets a sprig of parsley. So let's do that now. Have someone at your table distribute a sprig of parsley to everyone else at your table. I think I'll take that on because I'm already standing up. And I would say, pardon my reach, but there's no other way for me to get this over to you. So there you go. And Pastor, here's one for you. Yes, Elizabeth. There you go. And let's make sure, folks, that we give you a sprig of parsley. It is. <laughs> and you know what? It, this is interesting because I see, <clears throat> I see that at some tables, at some tables, the person who is distributing the parsley is sitting down. Others, though, are holding the plate in their hands, standing up, going to the left side. Now we know who's worked at serve, as service in restaurants. We got your number, man. We got it. So when you, uh, when you have the parsley in your hands, I will ask if you would direct your attention up this way. I'm going to show you what we're going to be doing with that parsley in just a moment. The Passover Seder uses a lot of these items because it's very visual. We use visual aids because it's one of the best ways to really remember anything. In a few moments, don't do it yet, but in a few moments, here's what you're going to do with your parsley. You'll take your sprig of parsley, and the idea is that in a few moments when you do it, you'll dip the parsley into the water, get it really saturated. When you do that, you'll then take the parsley, hold it up above the water, and shake it so that you can see the salt water drops coming down. And after you do that, you're going to take a bite. Why am I not taking a bite? Because everybody at this table is going to be using this very same thing of water, and I don't want to double dip because I love you. Anyway, let me explain this. Here's the significance. We put the parsley in the salt water. We hold it. We see the salt water drops coming down, and that's one place where we can get drops of salt water. Anybody know another? Yep. Tears. You do this because you want to see in front of you a visual reminder of the tears that the Israelite slaves shed when they were in bondage in Egypt. But the story, thankfully, doesn't end there. Parsley is a plant. Plants grow in the springtime, and spring is a, two, a time of new life. So out of their tears, God gave them new life, taking away their tears and sorrows. And now the salt water is to be to us a picture or reminder of the waters of the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea that God parted for the, uh, for the Israelites on their way out of slavery and to redemption. And how many of you know that's their story? Which means who else's story is it? Come on, you know by now. Right. We have a lot in common with those Israelites. Before we knew Jesus, we too were slaves to another Pharaoh, to the enemy. But what happened? Christ, our Lord, came down from heaven, taking away our tears. And now that salt water... How about it's a reminder of the waters of baptism? Because when we're baptized, let me explain what baptism is. It's an outward sign <clears throat> of our inward obedience to identifying with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. You take away even one of those three things, we don't have a faith. <clears throat> None of us would be here. Here's another reason for the parsley. Remember a little while ago, I went to the two different doorways, and I m told you about the illustration of the blood of the lamb that was slain and the blood uh, smeared on the lintel and the doorpost. When the people smeared the blood, they didn't use their hands. They used a plant, a plant called hyssop. And so the parsley is there as a reminder of the blood that was smeared on the prefigurement of a cross. And 
You know what's really profound? Think about this. You get to the New Testament, and the very next time you hear about hyssop, which was the plant, is when Jesus, our Lamb of God, is on the fulfillment of the lintel in the doorpost. He's on the cross. They try to feed him vinegar to drink, and they use a sprig of hyssop to do it. It's all about him. Always was, always will be. So at your tables now with your bowl of salt water, you have the parsley, dip it in the salt water, hold it up so that you can see the salt water drops coming down. And after you do that, feel free to take a bite. Yummy. <laughs> Not so yummy, no. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I will let you know there is one benefit of, of taking a bite out of the parsley. It assures you that you and everyone else at your table will now have fresh, clean breath for the rest of the night. Isn't that great? How are we all doing over here? You got some stuck in between your teeth. I know, same thing. <laughs> Happens to me every Seder, darling. Don't feel embarrassed. I'm right there with you. It's okay. Trust me. Now, after you've eaten the parsley, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit more about the unleavened bread that I told you about before. If you go to a Passover Seder at a Jewish home, usually they may have a plate on the Passover Seder table and probably have a stack of, oh, I, don't know, I don't know, 10, 15 slices of that unleavened bread. But always at every Passover Seder, Jewish people will set aside a special plate or under a cloth that will have exactly, no more, no less, than three slices of unleavened bread. If you ask the head of the household in a Jewish family, because they love this question, if you ask them why specifically they set aside three slices, they will smile at you and nod and, and, and give you this wonderful answer of assurance by saying, we don't know. Because they really don't know. The vast majority of Jewish people, they put three slices there, but they don't know why they do it. It's just tradition. Let me tell you where the tradition came from. Some time ago, the rabbi said, look, why don't we add something to the Passover Seder table that reminds the people of the three great patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I mean, sure, I see that triunity going on in these three slices of unleavened bread. But how about I think maybe, just maybe, all of us perhaps see an even better and even greater triunity going on in these three slices of unleavened bread. You have any idea where I might be going with this? How about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? Here's where things get really fun. Let me show you now what Jewish people do. Jewish people at their seders, Jewish people who don't even believe in Jesus. Let me show you what they do with one of these three slices of unleavened bread. When I show you what they do, you will pick up the significance of it in a second. But I will tell you that when Jewish people do this, the thought that will automatically occur to us, it'll be so obvious, it doesn't even enter their minds. Watch. It's at this point in the Seder that the head of the table will take out from these three slices of unleavened bread the middle piece, or let's see, to us that would be the sun piece, <laughs> they will then break it and they will then proceed to wrap the broken piece in a white cloth. Can any of you possibly see where we might be going with this? And then as if that weren't enough, and <clears throat> Pastor Jeff, here's what I need you to do in accordance with the laws of the Passover Seder. I need you to take that piece of unleavened bread broken from the sun piece wrapped in a white cloth and I need you, yep, to go and hide it away somewhere? Or, oh, I don't know, why don't we just say uh, bury it? Because a little bit later, at the end of the meal, there's another Jewish tradition at the Passover Seder, and that tradition is, and I'm so glad we've got so many kids here. Kids, at the end of the meal, at the end of the meal, what we're going to have you do is we're going to have as many kids who want 
to be able to go out and hunt down and search for and find that piece of unleavened bread and they will bring it back. Or why don't we just say they will resurrect it? You don't have any idea where this is going at all, do you? Now, Jewish people do this each and every single year at their Passover Seder. We all know this plays out the death and burial and resurrection of Christ. Jewish people who don't even believe in Jesus do this. And so, how many of you know that that's really interesting? But the thought doesn't occur to them. So would you like to know why they do it and what thought does? I'm going to tell you. Here's a personal story. Shortly after I got saved in, uh, in 1988, and it was April, and my wife Sandy and I were, were living in Florida, uh, a little later on that year would be Passover. And I remember uh, my, my mom calling us on the phone from New York, and she said to Sandy and I, she said, son, uh, we're having our Passover Seder this September, and uh, you know I've been trying to get them saved. And uh, so um, mom said, she said, I know you don't believe as we do, but but would you be willing to come up and be with us for the Passover Seder? And I said, oh, yeah. Because I knew that when we got to this, we were going to have fun. And so we, you know, got to the Passover Seder, and they got to the point where break the piece of matzah, you know, and Dad gave it to someone, and it's hidden away, and I, I couldn't help it. I could not contain myself anymore. I said, Mom, Dad, do you know that when hiding that matzah, you are playing out the death and burial and resurrection of a Messiah that you don't even believe in. They said, that's not why we do it. I said, fine, then why do you do it? <sighs> I will give you the answer they gave me. But hold on to your seats. It went something like this. They said, well, son, we know that each year, um, Passover comes at around the same time as Easter does. And, and I said, uh-huh. And, and, and they said, and we know that during Easter, you know, uh, all of the Christian kids, uh, you know, get to go out and hunt for things like, you know, Easter eggs and chocolate bunnies and marshmallow peeps. And I said, uh-huh. And they said, well, we didn't want the Jewish kids to feel left out, so we wanted to give you something fun to hunt for, too. <laughs> Are you kidding me right now? You guys got to go at least looking for candy. I had to find cardboard, please. <laughs> We're going to tell you a little bit more about that matzah as the Seder goes on. But pastor, yep, anytime you want, go and hide that. All right. And guys, while the matzah is hidden, this is very, very important. Okay. All the kids need to stay here because later when you, you know, when you go searching for the matzah and these kids can be really enthusiastic. We, you know, we don't want to get any reports like, like, you know, you went so far to look for it like you're on the highway in Clifton. Don't do that to us. Okay. But I'll tell you what I do need. I do need the kids for something special right now. I need four of them, four kids who can read Jonah, Elsie, you better get up here too. Elsie, where are you? Where's your Elsie, Elsie, come on up. I need two others. I see that hand. I need one more. I need one more young person who either knows how to read or can pretend really well. You're the one. Get up here. Give them a hand as they come on up, everybody. Here you go. Wow. Now, guys, I'm so, so glad. Parents, I'm so, so glad that you brought the kids. This is a great event to do it because there are parts of the Passover Seder that they lead, not me. And this is one of them. Guys, let me tell you why you're up here. What you're going to do, and you know what? I'm going to have you come right over here first because you came last and the last shall be first. There you go. All right. There, uh, in this particular part of the Passover Seder, we, we call this in Hebrew, Manishtana, which means why is this night different? There are four questions that children ask. We have four because each one of them will ask a question pertaining to the rituals of the Passover Seder. Are you getting undressed while I'm doing this? What are you doing? Uh, are you cold? You Okay. <laughs> All right, good. There are four questions pertaining to the Passover Seder. Each one of them will ask one question, and as we go on in the Seder, we'll answer it. Okay, so first, you're going to have the first question. Tell everybody, first of all, what is your name? Abigail. That is correct. Now, Abigail. <laughs> Sorry, Abigail, I couldn't help it. It's a beautiful name. Abigail, we have four questions that are asked for Passover. Here is 
the first one. And if you would read that for us and you need help, I'll help you out. You ready? On all other nights, we eat bread or matzah. On this night, why only matzah? Great job, Abigail. Thanks so much. You can go on back and sit down. Please give her a hand. She did so wonderfully. Come on up, Elsie. So, Elsie, you got now question number two on the sheet. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. On this night, why only bitter herbs? Very good. Thank you, Elsie. Appreciate it. And you are? Danica. Hi, Danica. You've got question number three, so please read that for all of us. On all other nights, we do not dip our vegetables even once. Mm -hmm. On this night, why do we dip them twice? Great job, Danica. Thanks for coming up. Jonah, come on over, buddy. Jonah, we've got question number four for you, and if you'd read that for us, we'd appreciate it. On all other nights, we eat, sitting, we eat sitting or reclining. On this night, why do we only recline? Great question and a great job, all of them. Thanks, Jonah, so much. They did it. Amen. So as our Passover Seder goes on, we're going to answer those questions. But first, what we're going to do now, it's time to go on to the second of our four cups of grape juice. And remember, everybody, we said that each cup goes by a different name. Anybody remember the name of the first cup? Right, sanctification or holiness. The name of this second cup is called the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues. And this cup is a reminder that God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt that led to the redemption of the Israelites from slavery. Now, the way that Jewish people, let's say, partake in this particular cup at their Passover Seder is a little bit unusual, but I'll show it to you. Typically, what Jewish people do to illustrate God pouring out 10 plagues is they will take their second cup, and obviously they, they don't drink it, but what they do is each time a plague is, is said aloud, which I'll do in a minute, Jewish people take their pinky finger, they dip it into the grape juice, they get a drop of grape juice on their finger, and then they dab their finger 10 times on a plate to show or illustrate how God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt. Nice tradition, fine tradition. We're going to be doing a different tradition tonight, which I believe is much more efficacious and much more within the spirit of understanding who and what Christ really did for us. Here's how it's going to work. You see that bowl of clear water that we washed in? Theoretically, it doesn't serve another purpose. So what we're going to do is in a moment, I'm going to have each and every one of you, or as many as possible, take your cup of grape juice, and I will say each and every one of the ten plagues in the order that they appear in the book of Exodus. Every time I say the name of the plague, you say the name in response, and then pour a tiny drop of grape juice from your cup into the bowl of clear water. Obviously, we'll do that 10 times. And after we do that 10 times, we'll look at the bowl of clear water. We'll see what's happened to it. And from there, we'll see what the powerful symbolism and significance of it really is. Amen? So get ready with your cups, if you will, of grape juice. And once again, sorry. Oh, I don't need that mic. That's right. I've got one of my own. I had two mics. You almost heard me in stereo. Let me put this away. Thank you. So, thank you, Pastor Jeff. So, what we're going to do, everybody, is I'll say the name of the plague. Every time I say it, you say it back and pour a drop of grape juice from your bowl, uh, from your, uh, uh, your cup into the bowl of clear water. Get ready. Here we go, everyone. Everybody say, blood. blood. Yep. Next one. Frogs. <clears throat> Lice. Oh my gosh, we've got frogs over there. We've got frogs. We have real frogs here in Grand Junction, Colorado at our Seder. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. Hang on, we're going we're, we're, we're to continue pouring in a minute. Well, we'll continue pouring in a minute, but, but I'm just hoping that like nobody's got any representation of the slaying of the firstborn. I'm just saying is all. <laughs> all right, so 
Let's see. So here's the next one. After blood and after frogs, the next one is lice. Good. Nobody's throwing lice. We're doing great. Flies. Cattle disease. Boils. Hail. There it is. There's hail. Oh, my gosh. Note to Pastor Jeff, call the carpet cleaners. You'll need them tomorrow morning. <laughs> Next plague, locusts. Next plague, darkness. Last plague, death of the firstborn. Amen. Great job, everybody. Give yourselves a hand. I'll tell you why in a minute. Good. Good. So, and I think I'll do this illustration from this table. You guys did a great job. Yeah. So what did we do? Obviously, we wanted to show how God brought down or poured out 10 plagues on the land of Egypt that led to the redemption of the Israelites. And as I told us before, the grape juice in your cup is to us to be a reminder of Christ's blood poured out for us. There were many ways that we could have done that but why, everybody, did I want us to pour something that's a reminder of Christ's blood into the bowl of clear water? It's because as a pastor, I believe that one of the greatest ways of learning Scripture is by being able to see it. And if you look in your bowls, you're seeing an incredible representation of John chapter 19, verse 34. Let me tell you what it says, if, just in case. It says that as Jesus was on the cross... In order to ensure that he was dead, you remember what happened? A Roman soldier came over, pierced his side, and out came blood and water. And when the two liquids dropped down his body and came to the foot of the cross and came together, perhaps they would have looked very, very similar in the color of what all of us, all of us, have in our bowls right now. A powerful reminder of the suffering, the extreme suffering, that he was willing to go through just so our, cleanse could, our, our sins could be cleansed and we would one day have the promise of spending eternity with him. If you've ever doubted or ever questioned God's love, look how much he loved you then. Look how much he loves you still. And look how much he always will. This is his love for you. Amen? Praise the Lord. Now, as we go on, in our Seder, I want to talk now about the, uh, you know, let's talk about the hard-boiled egg that you have on your Seder plates. You need to know that uh, at Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder, even though the Bible isn't specific about it, we have a pretty good idea of what Jesus and his disciples had to eat. It was really three things, unleavened bread, lamb, and bitter herbs. That's it. That's all they had on their table. So, how many of you know if that's all they had on their table and there was no hard-boiled egg on their table, then we're probably wondering, well, what the world is a hard-boiled egg doing on ours? And it's a good question to ask. And here's the answer for you. After the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70, the rabbis decided to add a hard-boiled or a roasted egg to the Seder table because they wanted to have some type of representation of what's called a peace offering. Let me explain. Passover was one of three appointed times where wherever you were in Israel, you were commanded to go up to the temple to worship God and bring sacrifices and peace offerings. And so the rabbis added that egg, if you will, as a peace offering and a reminder of the temple. When they added the egg, they weren't trying to point to Christ when they did it, but they ended up doing so anyway. And I think I'll hang with you guys for a minute to show you this illustration, but you'll probably all be able to see it. Let me take a look here at this hard-boiled or roasted egg that's referred to as a peace offering. Let's take those two words separately. The word peace. Well, how many of you know that points to Jesus because the Bible refers to him as the Prince of Peace? And what about the word offering? Is he not the greatest offering that any of us could have ever received from heaven above? But I'll tell you why else I like the egg. It's close. It's not exact because you can mm, define the Trinity but it's really tough to explain. And I know a lot of folks have a really tough time wrapping their mind around this. How, that, how do you get God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, that's three, and you call them one God? It doesn't make sense to a lot of people. They reject it. Well, let me help you out here. Uh, how many eggs am I holding in my hand? You bet I am, one egg. 
if I take the shell off, is the shell considered egg, yes or no? You're right. I take the white off next. Is the white considered egg, yes or no? Right. I take the yolk off next, or the yolk is left. Is the yolk considered egg, yes or no? You're right on all three counts. So I've got three, let's call them essences here. Each one is considered egg. Therefore, logically, I should have three eggs in my hand, but I still have one, don't I? So I guess you can have something that has three to it, but can still remain one. And, and for those who, you know, who just have a challenge understanding the concept of the Trinity or wondering, how is it possible for God to do that? He can be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and still be one. I don't get it. How is that possible for God? Well, think about this. If the egg that God created can do it, <laughs> then surely the Creator can do it. Amen? Amen? Thank you. I rest my case. <laughs> now, here's what I want you to do, everybody. It's time to start eating the unleavened bread, but don't eat it alone. We're going to put something on it. And so what I need you to do is one person at the table, would you please, you can unwrap the unleavened bread from your napkin now, and please make sure that everyone else at your table gets a piece of unleavened bread. Hold it in your hands. Don't eat it. I want to talk about it first and its symbolism to Christ, but make sure that everyone else at your table gets a piece of unleavened bread. Feel free to do that right now. Okay. How are we all doing here, guys? You good? All right. Excellent. There you go. Make sure everyone else at your table gets a piece of unleavened bread. We'll just give you a little while to kind of distribute it. There we go. All right. Everyone, everyone getting a piece of unleavened bread. Remember, the one on the bottom is gluten-free if you need it. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Good. All right. Everybody getting pieces of unleavened bread here. Looks good. Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Time out. Time out. I have a question. Who's the person at this, pr at this table distributing the pieces of unleavened bread? Okay, I have to ask you a question. What's your name? Karis. Karis that's right. We met before. Karis, I got a question. Um, Karis, why are you giving them such small pieces? <laughs> wait, Kar hold on. Wait. No, hold on. Time out. This is serious here. Karis. Why are we war rationing matzah at this table? Oh my gosh. Hold on. Listen, these people are starving. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Time out. I'll be with you in a second. I have to be a Jewish mother. Would you feed them for crying out loud? Listen, don't worry. I got my own stash up there. I'm bringing you more matzah. This is terrible. Hold on. Oh my gosh. Wait a minute. And listen, listen. Yeah, I, I've got to tell you, I, th this thought just occurred to me, by the way. You know how, you know, churches obviously from time to time take up donations for the less fortunate? If you have extra matzah, I cannot believe this. These people have to eat. My gosh, what time is it? 7.30. Some of us should have eaten two hours ago. Karis, you're killing them. All right, wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, is, is that extra matzah at our table? Okay, listen, they look really thin. Can we help them? Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You poor people. Here, eat, enjoy. Oh, my gosh. Are we good now? Praise the Lord. Man, let's, I'll watch out for you. It's okay. You know, so... So here's what I need you to do now, everybody. The unleavened bread, I gave so much away, I have a little piece. Don't worry, I'm fine. The unleavened bread, or the matzah that you're holding in your hands, obviously is food right out of the Bible. And you would expect it to be mentioned in the book of Exodus, which it is. But it's also mentioned somewhere else in the New Testament as well. Before I give you that New Testament verse, let me tell you why it's on the table in the first place, because when the kids came up, Abigail, I think it was you who asked the first question where you asked, on all other nights we eat bread or matzah, but on the night of Passover or on the nights of Passover, why only matzah? And here's the answer to the question. You need to know, everybody, that when the Israelites were finally released from slavery and bondage in Egypt, they didn't just walk out of Egypt. 
they ran for their lives out of Egypt because they knew that at any moment, Yul Brynner and his army was coming after them. Come on. <laughs> and so at one point, at one point, they got really hungry and they said, look, we've been running around. We've been trying to flee. Now we need to sit down. We need to have something to eat. And so they decided to eat bread. But the problem is that they couldn't spend enough time in one place. They were constantly on the run, which means they didn't have enough time while they were baking to allow the dough and the bread to rise. So that the bread they ate actually baked flat. And that's why we eat this type of bread during Passover as a reminder of the bread of affliction that the Israelites ate when they were fleeing Egypt. Now, this particular bread, of course, is that's one reason they ate the bread was because the dough didn't rise. Uh, but there's there's possibly another. Um, how many of you in here love to bake? Okay, so those of you who love to bake, you know that even if you do have more than enough time to bake something, if you don't add yeast to the recipe, I don't care how much time you have, it's never going to rise. We think that might have played a part in this as well because uh, follow the scenario. The Israelite slaves had been wanting to leave Egypt for more than 200 years. For the first time in 200 years, somebody comes to their door and finally says, you are free, get out now, run for your lives. If that was said to you, would any of you as you're bolting out the door come back and say, wait, I got to get the yeast. So we figure they probably didn't have yeast with them anyway. Either way, the bread baked flat. Mentioned in Exodus? Yes. But the food that you're holding, you know who else talks about it? The Apostle Paul. Let me show you where. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Listen to Paul's words here. They're to be taken not literally, but metaphorically. Think of it that way and you'll get this. Paul says, don't you know that if you add or put even a little bit of yeast into this recipe, even a little, you're going to ruin the whole loaf of bread. He said, so don't be like bread with yeast that puffs itself up. Instead, he said, well, be like this kind of bread. It's bread without yeast, so it doesn't puff itself up. Therefore, it's a reminder of Christ our Passover. How is Jesus our bread that doesn't puff itself up? Well, when Paul talked about bread that puffs itself up, puffing oneself up is pride and pride is sin. This bread has no puffing, so therefore it has no sin. And it's a reminder of Jesus. How? He's our sinless Savior and Messiah. In the Bible, he is called the bread of life. And by the way, everybody, what town was he born in? Right, Bethlehem. At least that's the English name of the town. But over in Israel, we refer to that town not by the English language, but by the Hebrew language. And in the Hebrew language, it's not one word, but two. It's pronounced Beit Lechem. The term bait means the house of, and the term lechem means bread. It's all about him. I want you to see a few things. As you take a look at your piece of matzah or unleavened bread, look at the darker side if you can. You'll notice it looks like patches, if you will, of brown and white. Patches or something pretty closely resembling stripes. A reminder of a verse that I alluded to before in Isaiah 53, verse 5, by his stripes... We are healed. Here's what I need you to do with your unleavened bread now. If you would take your unleavened bread, please, and crack it, okay? Yep, crack that bread in half. Everybody should be able to do that, except those at Karis' table. But no, no. <laughs> we love you, sweetheart. <laughs> and as you crack that bread, what did you see coming out of it? Crumbs. Why? Because it's dry. That to us is to be a reminder of Christ's condition on the cross and a prophecy of his crucifixion found in Psalm 22 where it says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my mouth. All my bones are out of joint. And here's something else, and this is probably my favorite analogy with the matzah. You really can't see it just looking down at it at your table. But what I want you to do is take your piece of unleavened bread Hold it above you under one of the bright lights. And now all of a sudden, you couldn't see it before, but all of a sudden now out of nowhere, what do you see running all through it in rows? Holes, right. A reminder of the holes or the piercings in Christ's body. 
And you know what's so profound about that? Think about this. We really and truly cannot see. We can't acknowledge his holes unless we are in the light. Got it? Amen. So here's what I want you to do, everyone. What we're going to do next is we're going to put something on that bread. And because that something is horseradish, and because since I think mid-January, I've probably done 50 to 60 satyrs and my taste buds like burned off two months ago, what I will do is I will be the first one to partake of the horseradish to let you know what you're getting yourselves into. So with that in mind, let me tell you how we're going to do this. What you're going to do is in a moment, you're going to put a tiny bit of horseradish on your piece of unleavened bread. Oh my gosh, Pastor, you're right. That is way too much. All right, we'll just go for it. And, and trust me on this one. Huh. Before you take a bite, oh, you pray. All right, I don't know what it is. Let me see what we got. By the way, uh, just tell me, is it a brand called Atomic? All right, let's see what we got. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So far, so, oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, keep your water close. Wow. This is the first time my sinuses have been cleared since Bill Clinton was president. My God. All right. Put a little bit, a little bit of horseradish on that piece of unleavened bread. Then take a bite, and then I'll tell you why you did such a thing to yourself. Go ahead, have some. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. I, I did. What? Oh, you can, you know, you can eat it now. Pastor, I, I've, I've got to share this with them. Pastor Jeff just asked me, should we eat it now? And, and I'm saying, when, as opposed to the rapture? Eat it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so, the horseradish, obviously, is very, very bitter. A reminder... Oh, wait, they're still, they're still trying to swallow. Hold on. <laughs> so, so, I'm getting... I'm, I'm seeing one of two reactions from you eating the horseradish. Some people have this real, you know, kind of uh, scrunched up face where they don't like it. Others you know, taste it, and they're kind of smiling, saying, you know, this would go real well with prime rib right about now. <laughs> Here's why we did this. The significance is so profound. Listen, the horseradish is very, very bitter. It's a reminder of the bitterness of slavery that the Israelites went through, and a reminder for all of us of being a slave to the devil, to the enemy. Here's another reason, everybody, another significance of the horseradish. This horseradish and the unleavened bread we ate it off of, there is a, an indirect connection to it in the Bible in Christ's Last Supper. Let me tell you where it is so that you'll always remember. There's a part of the Last Supper where Jesus and his disciples are eating a meal. And they're eating, they're having fellowship, everything's going great, they're having a wonderful time. And at that point, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus says something to turn this nice atmosphere totally on its head. He looks at his disciples and he basically says, by the way, now that you're enjoying your meal tonight, one of you is going to betray me, bon appetit. <laughs> and so at that point, what do each of his disciples say? The Bible records each and every one of them said, well, master, rabbi, teacher, you say one of us is going to betray you. Is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? Do you remember when they all asked that? Do you remember how Jesus responded to them when they all asked that? He said, I'll tell you who it is. It is the one who dips into the bowl. Now, we know that he was referring to Judas Iscariot, but we believe from that that he was referring to Judas Iscariot at the very moment that Judas Iscariot had with a piece of unleavened bread was dipping into the bowl of bitter herbs, just like we did here. Remember, it's all about Christ. You can't have a Seder if Christ isn't in it. So now that we've had the horseradish, here's what we're going to do next. You see that mixture of apples and dates and walnuts and honey and cinnamon, whether it's the one with the nuts or without. Oh, I want you to put a truckload of that stuff on a piece of unleavened bread. We'll taste that. 
Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that good? Oh, my. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Oh, Jody made it. Did Jody make the uh, the harosis? Mm -hmm. I would love some. Thank you so much. How are we all doing over here at my table? We good? All right. Mm, wow. Jody made it. Hmm. Jody, did you make the harosis? Excellent. Excellent. Praise the Lord. Thank you. So good. So much. So, you can probably get the symbolism and the contrast between what we had two minutes ago and what we have now. Out of the bitterness of slavery for the Israelites with the horse riders came the sweetness of their redemption symbolized through the harosis. Out of the bitterness of being a slave to the devil came for us the sweetness of our redemption through, through Christ Jesus. Amen? Something else to tell you about the harosis and why it's eaten and also why it looks the way that it does. It's intentional. It's chunky and it's gooey because it is supposed to be reminding us about the consistency, chunky and gooey, of the mortar that the Israelite slaves worked in with their feet to make the bricks to build the palaces for the city for Pharaoh. Got it? All right. So I've got a question for you. <laughs> Are you ready to eat real food now? Okay. Okay. We're only about, uh, oh, probably around five minutes away, maybe less. We got one more thing to do before our caterer serves us some of the greatest food you have ever had. What we're going to do is there's a custom that right before dinner is served, everyone has to sing a song, entirely every single word, you have to sing it every single word in the language of Hebrew, or we ain't eating. But it's okay because it's just one Hebrew word, that you keep saying over and over again. And that word is pronounced dayenu. Everybody say dayenu. It's beautiful. Would you like to know what you just said? Okay. The word dayenu means enough. And here's the context of it. It's not, <laughs> I have had enough of that horseradish. <laughs> what it is, is that if all God had done for the Israelites were to have brought them out of slavery and bondage, that alone would have been enough. But he didn't stop there. He did so much more for them. He brought them to Mount Sinai, gave them the law so that they could see there's no way anyone could obey it perfectly. And therefore, the only way out of their sin is not through ob obedience to commandments, but obedience to acknowledging Christ as Lord, Savior, Redeemer, Messiah, God, King, and everything. If all God had done for us were to have sent Jesus to cleanse us of our sins, wow, that alone would have been enough. But how many of you know he did so much and does so much more for us? Not only does he cleanse us of, of our sins, his atoning blood, but he gives us the promise of spending eternity with him. So we sing Dayenu. Really easy song, really easy tune. I'll start it off. You will pick it up in about a second and a half. Feel free to join with me, and then we'll have our meal. And this tune goes like something like this. Dai, dai, ye nu. Dai, dai, ye nu. Die, die, a new, die, a new, die, a new, sing it with me. Die, die, a new, die, die, a new, die, die, a new, die, a new, die, a new. Give yourselves a hand. You did it. You're amazing. Amen. So now, now the meal part of our Seder comes. Now, the Seder doesn't end when you end your meal. We're about two-thirds of the way through the Seder, but the Seder isn't over when your meal is over for a couple of reasons. We still have some things to do. I've gone with us for the, through the first two cups, but there's still two more cups to go. I've talked about a lot of the items or elements on the Seder plate, but we still have to talk about the shank bone. A little while ago, a piece of unleavened bread was hidden away or buried, and that still has to be found. And one other thing, before our Seder ends tonight, we have to invite a special guest. 
to come on in and join us. So a lot more going on, a lot, a lot of more learning about Jesus. That's who and what this is all about tonight. And let's give him praise because we're having a great time and we know it. Amen. Enjoy your meal, everybody. Praise the Lord. All right. So have a question for you and don't rush. Don't rush. I know some of you just got served. We're not going to rush you through dinner, but I just want to find out how's the food, everybody. Isn't that great? Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Enjoy your meal. I'm not going to rush you, but I will answer a, a question that, I, that uh, in, in fact, that I'm always asked and it comes up. So I'll share it with you because it also answers some of the questions that the kids asked earlier. And the question that I was asked was, so how closely does Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper align with or identify with Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder? I mean, how spot on did da Vinci get it? And the answer is, yeah, not so much. There are about, oh, I would say six errors or differences between uh, the portrayal of Christ's Last Supper in the Da Vinci portrait and Christ's Last Supper Passover Seder. So let me tell you what they are. All you need to do is listen. Just keep eating, but I'll share this with you. Uh, let me see. Number one, when you look at Da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper, you see Jesus and the disciples pretty much sitting up straight, and that's nice to look at, but that's not what happened at all. One of the questions that was asked, and I think it was the last question, was, on all other nights, we eat sitting or reclining. On this night, why do we only recline? And it's true. When Jesus and the disciples were having their Passover Seder last supper, they weren't sitting up in chairs. In fact, they weren't sitting up at all. All of them were reclining to the left, being propped up with pillows and cushions. Is it the most comfortable way to eat? Probably not. But here's why they did it. The reason that they did it is because unlike their ancestors who had to eat on the run and could not relax in Egypt because they were fleeing slavery, Jesus and the disciples were making a declaration saying, we're not slaves anymore. We don't have to run anymore. So you know what? We're going to eat our meal in a relaxed fashion and take as much time as we want to because we've been redeemed. That's number one. Uh, let's see, number two, since they weren't sitting and they were reclining, they didn't need a table. So you know that long, long, really long table in Da Vinci's Portrait of the Last Supper? And it looks like we're, oh my goodness, Bill, you are good. Listen, Bill, our audio video guy is amazing. Look at this. Here we go. Bill, thank you. So it's up on, it's up on the screen. See that long, long, long table? It wasn't there. Take that out. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Ah, I want you to look at the garments that Jesus and the disciples are all wearing. It's these nice flowing robes, which on the one hand would have been the fashion of the day. Sure, if, if, if the Seder were held in Rome or Florence or Venice or Genoa, because da Vinci was doing it from his Roman perspective, but the Passover Seder was obviously taking place in Israel. They weren't wearing fashions like this. Let's see, here's something else about the uh, Passover Seder Christ Last Supper. We know that Jesus and his disciples ate lamb for the meal. If you take a close look at Da Vinci's portrait of the Last Supper, yeah, Da Vinci didn't get the memo. Uh, his meal, the meal of holiness, if you will, would have been fish. And so Da Vinci painted fish on their plates instead of lamb. Newsflash, it was not the fish of God that took away the sins of the world. I'm so sorry. Uh, let me see. Two more errors to show you. I'm so glad this is up here, Bill. If you take a look, Da Vinci has painted in, because we know that at Christ's Last Supper, Passover Seder, they were eating unleavened bread. Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah, not so much here. Because in this portrait of the Last Supper, we see that for each and every one of the disciples, Leonardo da Vinci, has he given them flatbread? No, they each get their own Pillsbury Flake dinner roll. Thank you so much. And then finally, here's the big one. Look beyond Jesus and the disciples at the windows in the back of the room, and you see it's pretty much daytime. It's a beautiful, bright, sunny day. It's a gorgeous scene, but that would have been impossible. 
because according to the rules and the laws of Passover, you could not even sit down or recline to partake of the Passover meal until after the sun had already set. And now you know. Bill, thanks for putting that up. By the way, just want to let you know that, uh, and I want to take the opportunity to say hi to our folks who are watching us and commenting on live stream. Thank you so much for, for watching us. We've got quite a few. I guess we're going out all over the world. And to that, that uh, person on live stream who shared comments with us before saying, wow, I'm learning so much from the Canadian province of Newfoundland. And yes, that's how you, that's how you say it. Thank you, Canada, for coming to join us tonight. We appreciate having you with us. Really appreciate that. And, uh, and, and we invite, obviously, people from, from all over. And now, and now uh, again, uh, I know some tables uh, uh, were, were served earlier than others. Keep eating, adults, because being a parent with three kids, I can tell you that the, the kids were probably finished with their meal five minutes after it was served. So... For the kids, right, Joan? I know. So for, for our kids, uh, I've got something special for you guys. You'll remember, and I said there were parts of the Passover Seder that the kids lead. I can't do it, but they can. And this next part is one of them. Let me tell you what it is. You remember, everybody, that just uh, a little while ago, I had a piece of unleavened bread broken from the sun piece, wrapped in a white cloth, hidden or buried away just for a little while. Pastor, you remember when you did that? I know it seems like a long time ago. It kind of almost seems it was like three days and three nights ago when you had that thing, doesn't it? <laughs> and now, and now it's time for that piece of unleavened bread to be found and to be brought back. And young people, that's where you come into play. Hang on. Somewhere out there is that piece of unleavened bread. I need one of you to find it as fast as you can and bring it back to me. We're going to do it at the count of three. And then after three, you go one, two, three. Go find that piece of matzah. There they go. They're doing it. They're out of there. Oh, my gosh. I have never seen kids. Oh, okay. By the way, somebody lost the phone. It has a sunflower on it. Did you lose a phone? What? Look at the other side. It's Kate Spade. No, Kate didn't lose. She's the maker of the cell phone. Go. Don't worry. We'll find it. Oh, there we go. We found an op. We're going to find a piece of matzo, and we're going to find a cell phone. There you go. You bet. So, uh, Pastor Jeff, I see that the kids are still looking for it. And I know you had to hide it a second time, and I'm sure you made it even more difficult. However, to make sure that the kids find it before as opposed to after the rapture, <laughs> what I want you to do is if you could go out there and just give them a subtle hint. I mean, a, a very, very subtle hint. Something like, it's right there. So we'll have the kids look for a piece of unleavened bread. Hopefully they'll bring it back in. And they're still looking. So, so we're going to see what's going to happen. Pastor Jeff's going to help them out. So just, just keep eating. The kids will be back in a couple of minutes. And by the way, I have to tell you, this is my first time in Grand Junction. I am really impressed with your city because any town that could have streets with fractions on it, that's impressive. That's really good. I'm just saying it's all. <laughs> Where is he? I think I'm going to check with those kids, too. We'll see what's going on. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Do you think the second time Jeff hit it, he forgot? where? Oh, boy, this is going to take a while. Hold on. Oh, my gosh, we have a winner. Oh, my goodness. Come on over here. Okay, hold on. Interview time for our live stream, folks. One second. Wow. Here we go. 
So, Jonah, what a surprise. Okay, now, so, so, Jonah, I have to ask, I have to ask Jonah, I need your strategy here. How was it that of all the kids, you were the one who found the, stop looking at dad. Okay, now, how was it out of all the kids that you were the one who was able to find this piece of matzah? How'd you do it? Well, honestly, I just used the hands. <laughs> But then I also, I, um, I didn't figure that it was going to be in the back rooms because, like, that was where, like, almost, like, the salads and stuff were. And I didn't suppose it was going to be in the way of the, co in, of the cook. So I figured that it has to be in the main room somewhere, but it, like, has to be, like, somewhere obscure and out of reach. Somewhere that we wouldn't expect it. Like, well, in between chairs. To the best of my knowledge... This is probably, in all my years of doing Passover Seders, the first time that someone has pretty much used the Pythagorean theorem to explain how they found a piece of unleavened bread. Jonah, that was awesome, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <sighs> so, Jonah, can I have that piece of unleavened bread? Thank you, by the way, for just giving that to me. And I appreciate Wait, there's nothing in there. No, I'm only asking the other. Thank you, Jonah, for just giving that to me, and I appreciate that. But according to the rules of Passover, hang on to that, because before you can give that piece of unleavened bread to me, I need to give you something first to redeem it, like um, cash money. Oh, his eyes got real big. <laughs> so, Jonah, that's for you, man. Here's a couple of bucks for you. Now I'll take a piece of unleavened bread. Don't spend it all in one place and enjoy. Thank you so much. There we go. Amazing. So let's go through this. Piece of matzah or unleavened bread broken from the sun piece. <laughs> I don't need this anymore. Broken from the sun piece, wrapped in a white cloth, hidden or buried away, but just for a little while, brought back or resurrected. And as a result of that resurrection, a redemption just took place. Our redemption. Which brings us now to the third of our four cups of grape juice. Don't worry if you're still eating. Take another minute or two. I want to talk about this cup because in actuality, it's more special than the others. And I'll give you the thorough teaching on it. The first cup we said was the cup of sanctification or holiness. The second cup, the cup of judgment or the cup of plagues. This third cup is called the cup of redemption. And the significance for it is found in two places. Exodus 6.6 6 and Psalm 136. Take those two scriptures together, and there God essentially says, I will redeem you with a mighty hand and by my outstretched arm. Anytime you read the Bible and you see the phrase, the arm of God or the arm of the Lord, it's a messianic term. It's referring to Jesus. So what was really being said there was God said, I will redeem the Israelites with a mighty hand, but I will redeem the whole world with Jesus, the Messiah. How does Jesus redeem the whole world? By his blood. That being the case, and if this is looked at as the cup of redemption, where we are reminded that it was his blood that was shed for us, then there's something very, very special about this cup. And there's something that you might be interested in knowing. Remember at the beginning of the Seder, I asked you, I said, for how many of you is this your first ever Passover Seder? And quite a few of you raised your hands saying, yes, this is the first time I've been to a Passover Seder or participated in one. Maybe you think it is, but what if it's not? Because if you have ever partaken of communion, you have partaken of the third cup of Jesus' Last Supper, Passover Seder. Folks, many of you have done this before or part of it before. You just never knew it. Now, because this is the cup that represents communion, I'm not just going to say a little prayer and then say everybody partake. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because I would not be giving it the holiness, reverence, righteousness, and respect that the Apostle Paul says it should have in 1 Corinthians 11. As Paul is talking about partaking of the elements of the Lord's Supper, he basically says this. He says, when you partake of it, never make it common, never make it ordinary, never make it nonchalant. Always keep it holy and reverent and special. If you're just going to go through the motions and take it because that's what you do, 
Paul essentially said, you know, it's probably better off that you don't take it in the first place. Jesus also went on to say, as often as you do partake of it, or as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, which naturally causes many people to wonder, okay, then, well, how often is often? That's not the question, because it's really not so much about frequency as it is about focus. That being said, right before we partake of this cup, here's what I want us to do. We should partake of this cup in the right spirit, in the right manner, before Jesus, before God. And so in that regard, I want us in a moment to take a moment in silence with the Lord, asking him to cleanse us from any unrighteousness, anything that we know that we've been doing that displeases him, and anything perhaps that we might not be aware of that perhaps does the same thing that we would just be with him in this moment of great spiritual intimacy, asking him to help us through those things in our lives that we want to start, but it's really tough to. And, and listen, don't beat up on yourselves. The Apostle Paul said the same thing in the book of Romans. He said, Lord, you know, I'm doing stuff that I shouldn't be doing, and I'm not doing stuff that I should be doing. So let's take a minute with the Lord and ask him to help us out in those things in silence. And then I'll lead you in this cup. In Matthew chapter 26, it says Jesus took the cup, said the blessing over it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. We are reminded, and Jesus, we are so thankful that this cup, of course, is a reminder of the blood that you shed for us because it was and remains the only way our sins can be atoned for. And that's something that the Bible told us very early on in Leviticus 17, 11, where it said the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's the blood that atones for our souls. Now, of course, the penalty of that law is dead because we don't sacrifice animals for the issuance of that blood anymore. But the principle of needing blood to be shed from a sacrifice so that our sins can be atoned for, that has not been done away with. It never will. It's just that you do it for us now. We thank you for what you did, what you continue to do, and how the, the blood of, a, a, of 10,000, thousands, million sacrifices could only cover for a very, very short time. Couldn't erase, but could cover up our sins. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, that your sacrifice and your blood were once and for all for everyone. And we give you the praise as we're about to partake of this cup now. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to partake. Praise the Lord. I need now, at this juncture in our Seder, one volunteer. I'll take the first hand up. Oh, wow. Hold on, Jonah. I want to give somebody else a chance. Somebody else. Oh, you know what? I haven't seen you yet. Come on up. Come on up. Let's give this man a hand. Here we go. Tell me your name. Riley. Riley, I so appreciate you volunteering. And, and the reason I appreciate that is, Riley, you are a brave man. Because, <laughs> Riley, you just volunteered having absolutely no idea what you just volunteered for. That's a good man. So, so Riley, let me kind of, I'll, I'll kind of bring you into this, you know, gently. Uh, Riley, but do you like horseradish? No, no, I'm kidding, man. <laughs> Hey, he does. Good. We're going to do something else. Riley, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to the front door here at the church, hold the door open for about five seconds, and then let the door close behind you, and then just come on back to your table. That's it, buddy. Okay? All right. Do you, do you want a jacket or something? He's got the... All right. I mean, it's cold out there. Five seconds, you open the door in Arizona, you're like... Ah, you do it here, frostbite. I don't know. So Riley's going over to the door. Uh, I'll kind of cue you in. He's right there. He's opening it up. And one, 
two, three, four, five. Riley, come back in. All right. Are you doing okay? Fantastic. Give him a hand. Come on back to your seat. Come on back to your seat, buddy. There we go. Appreciate that. So, Riley, do you have any idea why I asked you to open up the door? I hope so. <laughs> what a great answer. That's the best. <laughs> the, the end part of his answer is, but because if it doesn't, I feel really foolish going out in the cold. <laughs> Riley, it does have not just some significance, but a lot of significance. In fact, what you just did for us, even though it was so simple, you did one of the most important parts of the entire night for us at the Passover Seder. Sometimes that which is simple can have the greatest impact, and I really appreciate it. Let me explain. At this part of the Seder, if you go to a Seder in a Jewish home, they will always send someone out of the room to the front door to open up the front door to invite a special guest to come in. Jewish people, when they open up the door, Riley, at their Seder, they are inviting the spirit of Elijah to come and join them at the Seder because one year they believe that when they open up that door, the real Elijah the prophet will come. And when he does, he will herald or announce the coming of the Messiah. And once again, their story, but who else's? Yeah, you know by now. Because didn't Jesus say that uh, John the Baptist came in the spirit of the prophet Elijah. And because didn't John the Baptist herald or announce the coming of the Messiah? In John 1, when he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Which brings us, everybody, to the last and final item or element on our Seder plate, the lamb shank bone. I love talking about this one the most because, gosh, the, the teaching is just so significant here and the, 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 the spiritual background of it is so intense. I think most of us by now have a pretty good idea of why we have a lamb shank bone on our Seder plate. It's a reminder of the blood of the lamb. Remember at the beginning of the night, the blood of the lamb that was slain, the blood smeared on the lintel and the doorpost that led to the Israelites Exodus from sin and slavery and the blood of Jesus, our lamb, on the fulfillment of the lintel and the doorpost leading to our redemption. But the story doesn't end there. I want to give you now, if you will, the rest of the story because it's so often not told that Passover Seders. And I don't know why, because I believe it's the most important. Here's what you need to know. In Exodus 14, I believe, God said, Moses, he said, you know, now that the Israelites are out of Egypt, I don't ever want them to forget this story, the story of their redemption and the story of how it was done by a lamb. And so Moses, I want you to tell the head of every Israelite household and their family to celebrate and acknowledge and observe Passover each and every year that it comes from now on, from generation to generation. God had specific instructions as to how he wanted the people to celebrate and acknowledge it. And he gave those instructions to Moses, and here's what they were. God said, Moses, each year before the Passover comes, four days before the Passover comes, I want you to have the head of every Israelite household go out among their fields and flocks and take hold of a male lamb that has no mark or spot or blemish on it. Now, when the head of the household found that lamb in their fields, they then would take that lamb and bring that lamb into their family's house. And they would take the next four days with the lamb living in their house to look over that lamb and examine that lamb and inspect and investigate that lamb to make sure that that lamb would be fit for sacrifice. Here's where the story goes to the next level. At the end of the four-day period on what was known as the Day of Preparation, Everyone who had a lamb in their house would bring their lamb outside the house into the streets and the high priest would come. The high priest would then lead a procession of those lambs through the streets to the place where those lambs were to be sacrificed. The sacrificial ritual of slaughter of those physical lambs would begin at approximately the third hour or nine o'clock in the morning. The sacrificial ritual would then go on for the next six hours and would therefore end at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or the ninth hour or twilight. 
And oh, by the way, when the sacrifice of the lambs was done, the high priest would make an official announcement telling everyone so. And we have it on good note that all that priest would have to do would be to say these words, it is finished. Now, if Jesus is our Lamb of God, truly our Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, and is the fulfillment of that Lamb, then I would suggest to you that everything that physical Lamb went through, Jesus, our Lamb, would have had to have also have gone through, and not just at around the same time, but right down to the same hour, minute, and second. And the question is, did he? And the answer is, oh yeah. So let me take you through the story again, and I'll show you how Christ fits into every single one of these parallels. Because remember, the story was all about him from the beginning. We said that four days before the Passover, the lamb went into the house. The Bible records that four days before Jesus' Passover, do you know what Jesus, our lamb, did? Went into the house, the house of God, the house of prayer, to cast out the money changers. So the lamb goes into the house, and Jesus, the lamb, goes into the house, and in both cases, it's exactly four days before their respective Passovers. Are you all following me so far? Okay. For the next four days... The physical lamb is examined and inspected and investigated to make sure that it would be the lamb fit for sacrifice. It, do you know what Jesus, our lamb, was going through during that exact same four-day period? It's easy to find out, and it's not a stretch. Just read Luke 20, 21, and 22. First, a group of people came over to Jesus, and they said, Jesus, we're noticing that you're standing out there in the streets and you're preaching the word of God. Who gave you? the authority to go and preach these things. What were they doing to Jesus, our lamb? Examining him, inspecting him, and investigating him during the same four-day period that the physical lambs are going through the exact same thing. Then a second group came over to Jesus, and they, they kind of had a little bit of a difference of opinion with him because he was suggesting they give their money and taxes to Caesars, and, and they said, why should we render to Caesars? And he said, you need to render to Caesars. What is Caesars? You see the coin with his profile on it. They weren't too receptive to that. What were they doing to Jesus, our lamb? Questioning him, examining him, and inspecting him during the same four-day period that the physical lambs were going through the same thing. And then finally, a third group came over to Jesus, and they were known as the Sadducees, and they asked one of the weirdest questions you've ever heard asked in Scripture. They said, Jesus, let's say that a man is the oldest of, he and his, his, of, of, of seven Jewish brothers. He's one of them. And this man marries a woman, but then he dies. Well, Jesus, according to Jewish law, the next oldest brother in line has to marry the widow, and he does, but then he dies, which causes the next oldest brother in line to marry the widow, and he does, but then he dies. So next brother marries her, and then he dies. The next brother marries her, he dies. The next, the next, the next. In other words, every time one of these guys marries this woman, they die. Okay, but you, you know what? Here's the part that has always confused me. Now think about this. If you're the last brother, you can't see where this is going? <laughs> Get out of there! Then the Sadducees said, they said, so Jesus, tell us, <clears throat> after all these seven guys have died and they're up in heaven, when the woman herself finally dies and she gets up to heaven, she sees all seven of them. Which one of them is she married to now? And the question was a nonsense question. Why? Because the Bible tells you that the Sadducees didn't even believe in resurrection. So why, what was the motivation for them to ask a question about resurrection if it didn't matter what answer Jesus gave? How about maybe their motivation wasn't to get an answer, but it was just to examine, investigate, and inspect him during the same four-day period that the physical lambs are going through the same thing. End of the four-day period. The morning of the day of preparation, physical lambs are led in the streets by the high priest to their place of sacrifice. It began at approximately the third hour at nine o'clock in the morning. Same day, same time, Jesus, our lamb, led in a procession through the streets by the high priest to their place, his place of sacrifice. And the Bible tells you it began at what time, please? Now you know why it did. 
The sacrifice of the physical lambs went on for six hours and ended, therefore, at three o'clock in the afternoon. How many hours does the Bible tell you that Jesus tarried on the cross? Yep. And therefore, his sacrifice ended at what time in the afternoon? It all matches. When the sacrifice of the physical lambs was done, the high priest said, it is finished. And you know, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, particularly chapters 10 through 12, that when Christ was placed on that cross, he not only became our once and for all sacrifice, he also became our once and for all high priest. And that's why at that exact moment, it was Jesus who said, it is finished. The Passover, as I said at the beginning of our Seder, was is and always will be about him. And I've got to tell you, we are so thrilled that so many of you came tonight, even though many of you didn't know what to expect because what an incredible night and what a blessing for all of us. And let me tell you what the blessing is. The blessing is that, in particular, we're only 24 hours away from Passover this year. But you know what? In coming years, Passover, and this is a good thing, will never have the same meaning to you ever again. Because tonight, we discovered the scriptures where Jesus has been waiting 2,000 years for us to fully discover him as the Passover lamb and have a more spiritually intimate relationship with him. And tonight, we found him. And now that we did, we've got him in that regard for the rest of their lives, the rest of our lives. How many of you know that's a cause for praise? And that's probably why your fourth and final cup is called the cup of praise. Lord God, we praise you for this Passover story. We praise you for the types and shadows and the symbolism that you put there. It was your divine plan before time and existence for this to happen. And we're just so grateful and thank you. Thank you for showing us yet another facet of Jesus that many of us never, ever even thought of. And now we have that to treasure for the rest of our lives. And anything that brings us closer to our Savior is something we want more of. We love you, Lord. We do indeed give you glory, honor, and praise. In the precious and holy name of Christ Jesus, and everyone agreed and said, Amen. Amen. You can feel free, if you'd like, to finish the rest of the juice in your cup. The Seder, by the way, formally ends with everybody saying three Hebrew words. And you guys did great with like charosis and dienu, so they, these words will be easy for you. I'll take you through them. I'll have you repeat them after me. The third word is kind of the longest. I'll break it up into syllables. It'll sound like more, but it's three Hebrew words. And then I'll tell you what those words mean. So here's the first one. Everybody say, lishana. That was good. Second word, haba'a. Yep, here's the third word. Biru, sha, layim. Three Hebrew words. Would you like to know what you just said? Means attention, Walmart, shop. No, no. So sorry, I couldn't think of anything else. That's that good. These three Hebrew words actually mean in English next year in Jerusalem. That wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great to have all of us a Passover Seder or even at another time to go to Israel, to walk where Jesus walked, to see where he carried out his ministry with his disciples? And listen, maybe you've gone 10, 20 years ago. My goodness, it's changed because there have been so many archaeological excavations since then that were not there years ago that now bring the Bible even more to life. So let me give you an example. Um, there was, I think about 10 years ago, an excavation done just north of Tiberias along the Sea of Galilee in a place called Magdala. They were going to build a hotel there. They started digging and they said, wait a minute, we've hit something. Stop the digging. Call the Israeli Antiquities Authority. They came, they sent archaeologists there, and they found a synagogue there from the time of Christ. And then they looked, they said, wait a minute, it's here in the northern part of the Galilee. And then they looked at the verse in scripture that tells us that Jesus preached in all of the synagogues in the Galilee. Guys, he was there. And all of these discoveries are now coming to light. So try, if you can, to take that opportunity to truly go to the land of Israel. Amen? Praise the Lord. Did you learn a little bit tonight? Have a good time tonight? Kind of... I told you we weren't going to be boring. 
here's, uh, here's what I'm going to do. And Bill, thank you, by the way, for manning the controls there on our AV booth. <laughs> Amen. Thank you also to the people on, and there are so many different streams, live stream, uh, what is it? Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I have no idea. Anything else going on out there, Bill? All right. I think we got it all. Thank you guys for watching. And before we close, a couple of other things really quick. First of all, on your tables, there's something else on your tables that, yeah, I can promise you, it was not there during the time of Christ. I put on your tables some cards from Jewish Voice Ministries International. That's the ministry that, that I represent. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about them because I want us to bless you. That's why I've given out the cards. Uh, let me explain what, what this ministry is all about and why I belong to them. Uh, 1967, there was a Jewish man in Phoenix, Arizona, a Jewish man named Lewis Kaplan, who came to the realization that Jesus, or Yeshua, was his savior. And he asked Jesus into his life, and he was so passionate about sharing the good news with his family. And they basically said, well, come on, we're the chosen people. We don't need Jesus. And Lewis Kaplan corrected them, and he said, excuse me, but Jesus has a much different opinion than you got. Because in John 14, 6, Jesus says, look, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, I don't care who you are, nobody comes to the Father except through me and me alone. And so he realized that doesn't matter who you are, everyone needs Jesus to get to heaven. And so he witnessed to his family, started a newsletter, newsletter turned into a radio show. Today that radio show is a television show that airs all over the world. Something else I want to tell you about on that card, and here's why I want you to fill it out. There's a lot going on in Israel right now, guys, especially with protests because Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, is looking to reduce the powers of the judiciary there. And many people think he's doing it because he may be in the midst of a corruption trial and he wants to take power away from the judges so that if he's found guilty, they won't have enough power to hand him a sentence that he might deserve. It's very, very complicated. God tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How can you pray for Israel if you don't know what's going on there? We're going to keep you posted. You'll see on the front of the card that I put on your table. And if you don't have enough at your table, I think I have some more at my materials table. There's a place for name, address, phone, city and state, etc. Feel free to fill that out. You can even do that while I'm talking. Now, the card is in two parts. Keep the smaller part of the card for you when you tear it off at the perforation. Give me back the larger part of the card, and I'll make sure at Jewish Voice Ministries that we keep in touch with you. Let me tell you about the bottom part of the card. There are several boxes on it. One box says go. And let me tell you what that's all about. For 20 years, we have been going, and I have been going, to places like India, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, Zambia. And we go to these places to hold medical missions clinics. Listen, there are people in these countries who are dying from something we take an aspirin to remedy. This is 2023. This is criminal. It shouldn't happen anymore. So we go to these places to provide free medical care. And we bring with us doctors, dentists, eye surgeons, triage nurses, you name it. And the last one I was on was in a little town called Masvingo, Zimbabwe. Our team was there for five days. In a five-day period, our folks treated more than 10,000 people in five days days. Do the math. It's incredible. Every time we did this for these folks, they would all ask us the same question. Why are you doing this for us? You don't know who we are. You've come from the other side of the world to give us free medical care. This is very strange to us. Why are you doing it? And it's a legitimate question that they asked. We gave them a very legitimate answer. And we said, the reason that we're doing this for you is because the God we believe in loves you so much he told us, we heard from him to do this for you because it's not us, it's the Lord doing it. And this is his way of saying he loved you. Praise God. Praise God. You want to talk about bringing people to Christ, that's how you do it. And so of the 10,000, about 3,500, 35% were willing to come into our prayer room to receive prayer for the healing and also to hear a lot more about this God. And I'll never forget the number. It's etched so deeply in my heart. Of the 3,500 who came into our prayer room, 1,462 gave their lives to Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what we do. So if you work in the medical field, guess what? Check the gold box. We need you. 
Because the more folks we have on staff, the more patients we, should, we can treat if you don't work in the medical field. Check the go box. We need you. Because you don't need a medical degree to pray for someone. We can use everybody. And listen, there's no commitment here. If you check the go box, no, it doesn't mean that Rabbi Jack is going to be putting you on a plane to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia tomorrow. We'll have somebody from our ministry contact you, get in touch with you, let you know about the medical clinics and make the arrangements for you. So that's what the cards are for. And I wanted to let you know about that because, and Pastor Jeff, thank you. Pastor Jeff has agreed that, you know, a ministry like this needs to be supported. So yeah, in a few minutes and pastor, however you want to do it is fine. We'll be receiving a love offering for Jewish Voice Ministries International. So I wanted to let you know that. Uh, pastor, before you uh, get into that and just think about that for a minute, some of you were asking me about the materials that I brought on our back table. And I'll tell you about a few of them. One that I won't tell you about is the Jewish Voice Study Bible because Saturday night I, I flew into Denver. I think I had close to 20 of them. I got one left. And it's on the table. And essentially, it's a study Bible. It's heavy. It's big. It's got over 70 maps, charts, graphs in there. The thing that, that, that I appreciate about Bibles, and here's how I select my Bibles, just so you know. Pastor Jeff, as pastors, people give us Bibles all the time. Translations we haven't seen and said, tell me what you think. I'll give you a week. I only need about 10 seconds. When anybody ever gives me a Bible, I always turn my go-to verses, Romans 10.4. Because in most of your Bibles, Romans 10.4 probably starts off by saying something like this. For Christ is the end of the law. It makes you think the law is dead. And again, the penalty is, but the principle is, and it's Jesus now. So it kind of throws the baby out with the bathwater. And the problem is when you use the word end, people think it means over, done with, gone. But yet the original Greek word in there, telos, doesn't mean that at all. It's a different definition. It means purpose, target, goal, or culmination. So when someone gives me a Bible and gave me that Bible and I looked at Romans 10.4 and I saw that that verse says it for the culmination of the law is Christ. I'm saying, yeah, that's a Bible. That's probably why I only have one left. But on the smaller card that you have, if and when that Bible is gone tonight, you can call Jewish Voice Ministries and order it from us over the phone. I brought this book with me tonight. This is called The Red Heifer. And I've only got a couple of these left. And one of the reasons I love it is because I was in Israel from February the, uh, this past February the 27th through March 12th. And toward the end of our tour, our Israeli tour guide said, listen, I have a special surprise for you, uh, but I, I need you to keep it under wraps. Don't take too many photos and don't tell people where in Israel we were. And of course, our ears perked up. And 10 minutes later, all of us were standing in the midst of the five red heifers that were brought to Israel. Guys, we saw them. And if you're unfamiliar with the story, the book of Numbers chapter 19 in the Bible says that in ancient times, in order for work and service to be done at the temple, the priests had to consecrate themselves in the ashes of a pure red heifer. It had to be at least three years old. And so there are many who believe today that God will indicate when the next temple is to be built, when he births more heifers that are still pure red by the age of three. These heifers right now about a year and a half to two years old, so it's not there yet. But five at one time is unheard of, so the world is watching. And it's a fascinating story, and this book has it in it. Uh, two more things real quick. I love this book. It's called Confessing the Hebrew Scriptures. And we actually uh, published this in answer and in response to so many people who contacted our ministry saying, you know, I would love if somebody is sick to pray healing prayers over them from a Bible verse, and I'd love to do it in the original Hebrew, but I guess I'll never be able to. And we said, why don't we make that dream come true for you? So what we did was we published this book, and we've got a couple of others. On every left-hand page, there's a beautiful full-color photo of a scene in Israel. That's the Dead Sea. On every right-hand page, there's a scripture about healing in the English on top. You see it in the Hebrew language in the middle, and on the bottom... It's in English transliteration so that theoretically, when you read English transliteration, theoretically you're, you're, you're speaking Hebrew. And the reason that I say that is because not everybody says English words the same way. For example, in about uh, two weeks, two and a half weeks from now, I will be up in Saskatchewan in Canada. And they say English words very, very different in some cases than we do. Do we have anybody here from Canada tonight? Anybody in the room? 
Okay, let me kind of fill you in. If let's say we are going shopping here in Grand Junction, we back our car out of the garage and we go to Albertsons and we buy processed cheese. In Canada, they back their car out of the garage to go to Sobeys to buy processed cheese. So even if you've got transliteration, you might not be getting it right. Transliteration's not enough. That's why we put a CD in the back of this for you so that you could say, now I know that I got the transliteration right and I'm speaking Hebrew. This, by the way, as some of you are looking at it, it's in the thin white boxes. This is in Hebrew. Um, it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, where God says, write my words on the doorpost of your house. That scripture is in here in parchment, and there's a hole on the top, a hole on the bottom, so you could put it on the right side doorpost. We see this all over Israel, and many people in the U.S. do it as well, just so you know, because somebody asked me what this is called in Hebrew, I will say it slowly. It's pronounced mezuzah, and the reason that I say it slowly was because some years ago, I remember speaking at an event, and I guess I said mezuzah so quickly, and I had a gentleman come to me afterward. He said, Rabbi, he said, I would like to see one of those Medusas that you were talking about. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I spoke too quickly. It's called a mezuzah. M Medusa is, is the woman with the snakes in her hair. We don't sell that one to anymore. But anyway, so that's what that's for. And uh, last but not least, we do have sterling silver necklaces over there with what look like lines in the middle, but those lines are actually Hebrew letters that spell out the word Yeshua. So that's Christ's name in Hebrew. So uh, I'll be over at the materials table in, in just a few moments. But Pastor Jeff, why don't we do this? I will have you head up this love offering for Jewish Voice Ministries with the folks any way that you desire. And then how about after that, I come up and I send everyone home with the priestly blessing, the Aaronic benediction from the book of Numbers chapter 6. I'll say it over you in English and then I'll sing it over you in Hebrew. Sound like a plan? All right. Pastor, thank you, brother. You bet. Fun? Yeah, it's on. Yep. Okay, real simply, what we will do is we have a couple of agape boxes in the foyer. And so if anybody wants to write a check, you can write that out to Jewish Voice Ministries and put it in there. Uh, if you want to put in cash in there, there's little envelopes. You just write on there, Jewish Voice Ministries. And then before everybody, or well, not everybody, but before uh, Rabbi Jack leaves, we'll make sure uh, he gets all that. So very simply, um, on your way out, you can drop something in the agape box and we'll make sure he gets it. All right? Amen. Pretty simple. Amen. Thank okay, you, brother. You're up. And uh, by the way, you can put your cards there in the box. Uh, you know, whether if, if let's say you wanted to make a, a donation by credit or debit, don't don't throw your credit card in your agape box. Don't do that. But you could write it if you want, write it on the back of the card and throw that in. By the way, if you're making a credit or debit uh, card donation on the back of the card, don't forget to put your name, address, and phone on the front of, of the card. Because if we just have like your signature and the expiration date, we won't be able to process it. And we know that you want that to happen because you're blessing us. Thank you again, my gosh, for coming out to this Passover Seder. We are just overwhelmed in a great way. Jody, you and Craig, my goodness. My goodness. Praise the Lord. How long ago did we talk about this night? And we said, you know, maybe we could do something like that, you know, uh, right here. And, and how many of you know we did? And how many, of you, how many of you think that maybe we should do it again sometime? I do too. I do too. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, let me send you home with this blessing. And as I said, it's from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. I'll say it over you first in English. And then I'll sing it over you in Hebrew. After I do that, would you be kind enough to give me probably a five-second head start so that I can get to my materials table, shake your hand, give you a hug, just express my appreciation for your coming. Uh, I'll pick up your cards from you if you want there or, or you know, put them in the agape uh, box, how are you Dean fit. But uh, really appreciate you all going out. And Pastor Jeff and Elizabeth, thank you for opening up your spiritual home for all of us tonight. It was a wonderful night. So to each and every one who's come, whether you're here live or, or watching us on live stream, 
This blessing is for you as well. I'll say it over us first in English. To each and every one who has, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God lift up his countenance upon you. And may he grant you his peace in the Hebrew. Shalom. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. I'll see you again. Thank you so much for coming.